tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about scorned soulmates and revealing recordings. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly sponsored by Policy Genius. Life is full of unexpected surprises, the largest of those being the loss of one. If the stories we experience together each week remind me of anything, it's that one's life can end unexpectedly and at any time. Yes, the hand of death knows no mercy, makes no trades, and feels no regret doesn't discriminate based on age, religion, social standing, or anything like that. The fact is, as much as it hurts to think about, you could be leaving your family financially devastated and unprepared. That's why I'm grateful for Policy Genius. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. In minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. And what's more, you could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. They don't take advantage of you like other companies have been known to do. There are no extra fees. Your information isn't sold to third parties and has options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid those invasive and often unnecessary medical exams. And I know that's the part I dread the most when thinking about life insurance policies, other than the concept of impending death, I mean. Don't believe me? Well, far be it for me to be a professional insurance salesman. Check it out for yourself. Head to policygenius.com slash chilling to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save today. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of N.M. Brown and Patrick Narvasa, our voice talents Melissa Medina, Lucas Webley, Eric Peabody, Jesse Cornett, Kyle Stroud, and Justine Anastasia. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first story tonight is written by author N.M. Brown and is performed by Melissa Medina, Lucas Webley, and Eric Peabody. In it, we'll meet a woman who finds that the man she was making a future with wasn't really hers at all. What do you get when you cross the luck of the Irish with a woman scorned? Let's find out now. Without further ado, I present to you Crimson and Clover. Clover. 
My face is raw from tears, and my hands have been shaking for almost an hour. Why did he do this to me? I don't understand. I pick up my phone and redial my boyfriend's number, praying with all my soul for a different result. Once again, my hopes were shattered upon hearing a message saying that the number wasn't accepting incoming calls. Caught up in my heartache, I dial star 67 before his number and call again. It rings. His phone rings and rings until I get a message saying that his voicemail box is full. Opening the Facebook app on my phone, I type in his name. No results pop up in the search engine. I mean, what? Switching over to an ancient profile of mine, I search again. There he is. All the pictures posted were ones that he sent me. Under the About section, it says that he's engaged? What the fuck? He and I had talked about marriage for months now, but he's never asked me officially. I mean, did I miss something here? Then a post from someone that I didn't recognize, Rita Jacobs, posted, I love you so much, next to a picture of a three-stone engagement ring. The same kind of ring that I told him I had wanted. Furthering my emotional path of self-destruction, I clicked on her profile. Her about section also listed that she was engaged to Eric Dodd. No, Eric Dodd is my boyfriend. Not even one week ago, he blew up my phone with calls and text messages. Then one day, I got a text saying that he was arrested and would be in jail for a while. Okay, well, if he'd been detained, I would have been able to find the police report and a mugshot, which I didn't. Also, if he'd been in jail for an extended period, his phone would have died. Also posted is a picture of the sweetest looking little boy with all too familiar eyes. The caption read, We miss you, Daddy. A barren ache in my throat snaps me back to attention. I realize that my mouth's been hanging open for quite a while. My heart feels like an empty can being crushed in slow motion. Eric doesn't have any children. He told me that he wanted me to be the only one to carry his children. She posted a video and tagged him in it. The YouTube video was to the Chicago song, You're the Inspiration. And that was a song he had always sent to me to make up after a fight. He told me that was our song. I run to my sink and empty the sparse contents of my formerly starving stomach inside of it. My heaves give way to fresh tears that burn my irritated eyes. My stomach aches. Each piece of new information is a sucker punch to my heart and gut. Pause. Okay, so you may have some questions. First off, no, I'm not completely stupid or blind. There were no signs Eric exhibited that I chose to ignore. We'd been together in our late teens and were madly in love, to my knowledge. He was forced to move away with his parents and left my life completely. Thanks to the wonders of social media, we reconnected 11 years later. He lived many states away, but drove down to see me for a four-day weekend once a month. I had my issues and situations that didn't permit me to visit him in his home state. He never seemed to have a problem with always having to be the one to make the drive. I guess I know why now. So that's how I didn't know. That's how I was able to be made such a fool of. The chump of all chumps. Play. I throw open my dresser drawer and search frantically for my medicine bottle. My doctor had prescribed me clonopin a few months back for anxiety, but I had resisted taking it until now. My phone was clenched in my hand with a white knuckle grip. The urge to dial his number was consuming me more with every heartbeat. I knew that I wasn't likely to stop if I started calling, and I felt like enough of an idiot already. Why? He said so many things to me. He shared so many heartfelt stories, made many promises, and envisioned many things for our future. I mean, why? What was the point of any of it? All the jewelry he bought me, the way he held me and whispered sweet sentiments in my ear as we slept, all the laughter that we shared, him begging me to let him be the shoulder that I cry on. We shared our deepest secrets and 
For all I know, every word he uttered was deceptive. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I was always upfront about my bullshit. I don't trust that many people. He knew that. He knew that everyone who I've ever loved had either died or decided that they had a better life without me. And hell, to be honest, if he were just straight with me from the beginning, I probably would have still been with him. But to ghost me like that, at our age? Go from talk of marriage and baby names, Christopher for a boy, Brienne for a girl, by the way, to blocked without a word. There was no, hey, this isn't working, no, yeah, I'm gonna have to pass, no, go fuck yourself, nothing. I honestly thought he was dead for the first 24 hours of no contact. Not to even mention that that very first day was my 33rd birthday. He told me weeks ago that he couldn't come down because of work. I'm not even making this shit up. I wish to God that I was. This is a fuck you that's messed up on a level that my soul can barely fathom, let alone fabricate. Fast forward eight hours. I decided to go to a bar in town called Killian's to try and break my cycle of rumination. There are enough people inside for the atmosphere to be welcoming, but not so many that I felt suffocated. As I hopped up onto it, scooting closer to the bar counter, a man with shaggy dark hair that hangs in his face sits two stools over to my left. There's a brief nod of acknowledgement exchanged. I'm trying to be polite more than anything, honestly. Not to say that I don't notice how amazing he smells as I wait for my drink. Before long, I'm wondering what color his eyes are. And not that it matters really with all that hair in his face. The ghost of Eric's face fades from my mind more with every drink. Things are going well, and I have high hopes for a peaceful, blacked-out sleep tonight. My desire is to be dead to the world like I feel on the inside. I want to wake up when it doesn't hurt so much anymore. The music player that they had clicked over to a new song. I could barely begin my ears as the familiar notes started to play. I try to stifle an involuntary moan of pure sorrow, but the sound escapes my lips all the same. That's our song. Or is it their song? The song. Tears shine the skin of my cheeks like clear nail polish. My heartbreak painted on my face for all to see. There's a sudden heat and pressure on the back of my chair. The smell of musk leather and the slightest hint of motor oil pleasantly invades my senses. It's the man with the dark hair. Hey, love. What's this? What's a nice bit of fluff like you up to 90 for? My face melts at his Irish accent, but I have no idea what he's saying. He can tell as much by the look on my face. Why are you crying? Don't tell me it's over some wagon. Any fella would be lucky to have you for a mutt. I immediately make a mental note to Google Irish slang when I get home. He hands me a napkin. I take it and smile weakly at him, finally composing myself enough to meet his eyes. (sighs) They're green. Not just any green, either. The most beautiful shade, just like emeralds. I've never seen eyes so beautiful. My eyes take their time, leaving his gaze. Coyly, I reply that I don't want to burden anyone with my troubles. However, before the hour passes, I find myself verbally unloading my situation in its entirety. A look of pity mixed with concern washes over his face. Oh, I bet that's absolutely scarlet for you. You loved him for a donkey's year and the whole time he was acting the maggot. Somehow, this time, I understand what he's saying. My sniffling slows as I nod in agreement. He continues... I know you feel pure Gabby right now, but you seem like a nice girl. I interrupted him. Uh, forgive my ignorance, but you're gonna have to dumb it down a bit for me here. I'm having trouble understanding you. He lets out a laugh that brings out a twinkle in his eyes. The sound dances through the bar like wind chimes on a breezy day. I'm trying to say that no lash deserves to be treated that way, especially not on her birthday. Did you even have a cake? No. Let me hit the jacks and I'll be right with you. The charming stranger disappears into the men's room. When he gets back, I ask him what his name is. Name's Kevin. What do they call you? His accent's still apparent, but at least I can understand him now. Reluctantly, I answered him. 
Call me Karen. I'm not letting my smile show just yet, but I know my eyes gave me away. Kevin and Karen! <laughs> he says, his chuckle booming heartily through the bar. A server comes out from the kitchen with a large piece of cake and brings it up to the bar. She sets it down in front of me, smiles, and walks away. I turn to Kevin. Red Velvet is my absolute favorite. <laughs> What's this about? This time, a complete smile blooms on my face like the first flower of spring. Kevin takes out a single candle from his breast jacket pocket. He looks dapper as hell in his brown suit, complemented by the slightest accents of green. The candle's color matches the green of his suit, but with a silver swirl throughout it. This is the most beautifully detailed birthday candle I've ever seen. He held a large stone that I somehow had missed before in his other hand. Taken aback, I push away from the bar a bit and hop off the stool. What is that? Why do you have it? Let's see where this goes. There are too many people here for him to attack me with it. I mean, hell, it's been such a shitty week and you can't go wrong with free cake. Garen, take the candle and push it into the cake. After I light it, close your eyes, grab the stone, and concentrate. Think about how you want that bastard to suffer. Think of all the ways your life would be better if he had never been born. Dwell on all the empty promises he made. As you blow out your candle, turn the stone counterclockwise. He thrusts the candle into my hand, and I gladly take it. Placing the candle into the soft red velvet, I concentrate. I wish Eric could feel what I've been feeling for the past week. I wish that he was held to every single promise that he's ever made to a woman. My heart and soul aren't to be taken for granted. They deserve to be avenged. Eric must pay for what he's done to me, and who knows how many other women. I blow out the candle and turn the stone in one fluid motion. Though not within the realm of possibility for my current location, I swear I felt a slight breeze drift through the whole bar once my candle flame died. Other than that small and possibly fabricated detail, I felt no different. Kevin and I continued talking throughout the evening. We both lost track of time, and it was almost one in the morning before long. This is the longest that I've gone without thinking about Eric, and I'm not ready for it to end. I break out my dancing bedroom eyes and turn on some charm of my own. Eric certainly didn't give me a second thought while he fucked Rita night after night. It's time to stop worrying about him and start caring about me. Kevin was only in town for the week of St. Patrick's Day and stayed in a hotel not too far from Killian's. His room had that same wonderful smell that he did. It's almost like he sweats pure testosterone, sex, and cologne. Our tongues and lips dance in the most erotic but natural way. It all feels incredible. I'll leave the rest of the night to your lurid imaginations, but I woke up a happy bit of fluff. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. We've all got our crosses to bear, listeners. We're freaks, we're spazoids, we're weirdos, we're tweakers, we're boneheads, we're basket cases, we're stoners, drunks and junkies, we're carpet baggers, we're proletariats, we're drag queens, we're despot dictators, but above all, dear listeners, we're people. People have problems. There's just no way around it. When you consider our diverse set of issues, there's really only one thing we all have in common we can all get better with a little counseling. And the best way to do that is with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the modern way to care for the human condition. You don't need to be a head case to benefit from professional therapy. In fact, if anyone among you who hasn't the slightest bit of baggage, speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, certainly is peaceful in here, isn't it? That's right, we could all use a little talk therapy. BetterHelp is for everyone. They can help you with any number of problems, from depression and anxiety to the most obscure issues. 
Whatever is keeping you from being your best, BetterHelp has a licensed therapist who's just perfect for you. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be shooting the breeze. You can message them anytime and receive timely responses. You can schedule phone calls or Zoom meetings weekly. It's all remote. No need for office visits or awkward waiting rooms. Eureka! No longer is therapy itself anxiety inducing. It's comfortable, it's convenient, and best of all, it's affordable, much cheaper than traditional therapy. There's even financial aid available if you need it. If you've ever called a crisis line or tried a self-help program, BetterHelp is nothing of the sort. It's genuine therapy designed for real results. Over 2 million people have used it already, and I invite you to check out the testimonials on their website just to see how much it's helped them. Because of that, BetterHelp has become so popular, they're recruiting new counselors in all 50 states. We're all unique listeners with our own personalities, proclivities, and problems. But with a little help, we can all be our best selves. Remember, as far as we all go to treat other people well, you never want to neglect your most important relationship, the one you have with yourself. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash chilling. That's BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I learned last night that that phrase is meant to describe attractive girls. Stereotypical and offensive as this may be, I found myself humming Danny Boy the whole way home. Dropkick Murphys is instantly added to my playlist as I replay the night I spent with an Irish god. The tingles still linger on my skin. My second week without Eric is blissful. The memories of my exotic stranger refresh me. A banging on my door startles me out of peaceful sleep. My dragging body trudges towards the door and I stare out of the peephole. My heart plummets at the sight of a very disheveled Eric standing on my doorstep. A week ago, I would have traded anything to be in this situation, but now I find myself barely wanting to answer the door. I do though, no use letting him stand out there. Karen! Oh my god, baby. He throws his arms around me and squeezes tightly. Honey, I'm so sorry. I messed up so badly. You have to help me. I should never have hurt you as I did. Tears are spilling over his cheeks and his voice is shrill with panic. I killed someone. I don't know why I did it, but I killed her. Despite his terror, I can't help but interrupt him. You mean Rita? He winces at the sound of her name. Oh, Jesus, Karen, I'm sorry. I never meant for you to find out. I blocked contact because I didn't have the heart to tell you. It's always been you. My heart's been torn between my obligations and what it wants. I tried to leave her so many times. He quickly changes the subject upon seeing rage flash through my eyes. No, it wasn't her. When Rita was pregnant, I had a woman on the side. Rita found out about it and made me promise never to speak to her again. She made me promise her repeatedly that the woman's life never meant a thing to me. She asked me if I would care if the other woman died, and I said no. That doesn't mean I wanted her dead. I haven't even thought about her in years. A sinister chuckle travels through my soul, up to my throat, then out into the atmosphere. <laughs> so, you use me, sleep with me, lie to me, then expect me to aid in a better crime by letting you stay here? You deserve what you get, dick. 
You're not my problem anymore, and lucky I don't call the cops right now. I don't want to know any more information. Just leave. Now I see it. There's that look I've been craving. One of pure hopelessness and shock at my refusal to help him. I've always loved his eyes. I gave him all the contents of my heart. There's nothing left to heal or forgive. He must deal with the consequences of his actions. He leaves, walking out backward for whatever reason. I get dressed and head to Kevin's motel in a fit of spiteful adrenaline. Supposedly, he's here for four more days, so I should be able to catch him. The muscle memory of my feet takes me right to his door, room 1014. I knock and can hear a shuffling from inside. The smell turns me on instantly, even from outside the room. Kevin answers the door. I put on my widest doe eyes while asking, hoping to further my chances. Somehow he's even more handsome in this surprised, rugged state. Hey, Kevin, can I come in? I've had a weird night and need someone. Have any Jameson left? He opens the door wider to let me inside. Putting pride aside, I sit down on his bed. We need to talk. Eric came to see me all wigged out. He says he just killed some lady, not his wife, by the way. I just needed to leave the house for a bit in case he tried to come back. My body is trembling with attraction, but it could very easily be perceived as fear of Eric. I'll let him think that. He lets out that booming, dark laugh that I love so much. Nothing to fear, Karen. It is only the beginning of this gobshite's journey to hell. He explains further once he sees the confusion on my face. Why is everyone so surprised when they make a wish and it comes true? Isn't that the point of things? What did you wish for when you turned to Bullenstone? I answer him quickly, but only answer his question with one of my own. Uh, what's a Bullenstone? It's an Irish cursing stone that was used in conjunction with an Irish wishing candle. It grants your birthday wish. I shake my head with a chuckle of disbelief. I am shocked at the level of bullshit he is spitting right now. So, what, you're like some kind of leprechaun? His eyes narrow, and it's the closest thing I've seen to anger that he's shown so far. Leprechaun? Come now, Mott. Am I half-sized with flaming hair and a pipe? Haven't you ever heard of the Black Irish? It's not all freckles and red hair, you know. Now he's the one to shake his head at me, clearly offended. Unfortunately for me, it appeared I would not be taming the snake this St. Pat's. I quickly apologize, gather myself, and leave. I thank him for everything he's done for me on my way out. A month goes by, completely uneventful. I started to put this all behind me one day at a time. Dating is definitely off of the table for a good while. Painting always used to be cathartic, so I recently picked it up here. I was in the middle of a black and red sunflower when there was an odd sound at my door. It sounds like someone was knocking, but from the bottom of the door. There's no one visible through the peephole. Slowly, I open the door to see what's going on. A trail of red consumes the entire middle of my porch, ending at Eric's feet. The bottoms of his jeans are caked in brown and red. A bit of bone sticks out from the bottom of his left pant leg. I don't see any shoes or feet. Eric lays there sobbing, his face a sickly shade of purple. Help me in. I walked all the way here from home. I couldn't stop walking. So much walking. My feet. I need an ambulance, but I can't call them because of the police. Help me, please! I hurriedly dragged him inside, doing my best to clean the floor on the way. He settles uncomfortably on the couch. I ran to my bathroom to get towels and water, and a gut-wrenching scream comes from where I just left Eric. I know we've had our differences, but my blood can't help but run cold when I see him. His face is a mess of gore, where his two perfect hazel eyes used to be. Now were two bleeding sockets. He held his hands out toward me. 
I always said, I only had eyes for you. It makes sense now. Eric always promised me that he would walk to the ends of the earth to get to me, though it wasn't that extreme of a distance. He promised me he would never turn his back on me. That's why he left walking backward from my house. He promised Rita that girl's life meant nothing to him. He promised me that he only had eyes for me. There's just one thing left. I sit on my living room floor, cutting with a surgical precision that surprises me. This is messier than I want it to be, and I severely hate to share. I'm not the only one he's hurt, though. I'll keep the biggest piece for myself and give the girls the other pieces. The first promise he ever made to me was that I'd always have a piece of his heart. I hope you enjoyed Crimson and Clover. As written by N.M. Brown and voiced by Melissa Medina, Lucas Webley, and Eric Peabody. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. Friends, I'm here to tell you about the best Match 3 style puzzle slash adventure game with RPG elements ever created. Now if that sounds a little complicated, let me assure you, the game is as simple as can be. Anyone can play Best Fiends, it's just that it's got so many elements to it, it's tough to lump it into a category. Picture this, you and your band of fiends are on a mission to blast the bad guys off of Mount Boom, the evil nefarious slugs, the most ghastly of gastropods. And the way you do it is by matching three or more identical objects on your game board, and the more the better. Everyone loves a good matching game, but the objects don't just disappear like they do in most apps. Think of them more like propellant for a high-powered slug annihilator. And once your team of fiends gets a hold of the ammo, they turn the slugs into s cargo. Your fiends begin the game as babies, but as they grow and evolve, they take on new forms and become more powerful. With the keys and gold you earn, you build up your team, unlock achievements, and evolve your fiends into a battle-hardened army of slug destroyers. It's a lot of fun to get brand new fiends and watch them mature and transform, and as they do, the puzzles get more and more challenging. Take it from me, you'll always want to beat just one more level, and you'll never run out of them either because there are thousands of levels. Here's a little tip from a best fiends professional. Connect enough objects at once. You better hold on to your hat because you're about to unleash Slugmageddon. You can always tell when I've nailed a Slugmageddon attack because I scream like Rambo with a belt fed machine gun. It's awkward in public, of course, at the library and church during a funeral, but I just can't help it. There's no data or Wi-Fi required to play Best Fiend, so I'll play it just about everywhere I go. And if I get a little noisy, well, what can I say? Best Fiends is a scream. So let's make some noise, folks. Best Fiends is free to download, so you can join me and 100 million others climbing to the summit of Mount Boom. You'll be glad you did. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Thank you for your support and for supporting the sponsors that make this show possible. Our very own N.M. Brown's work can be found right here on this channel, as well as on the Creepy Podcast. She's got a lot more in store for us. You won't want to miss it. 
As a reminder, voice actress Melissa Medina's work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's YouTube channel as well as her website, hearmelissa.com. That's H-E-A-R-M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot com. Lucas Webley is a commercial and dramatic voice actor from Central England and host of the Simply Scary Podcast Network's Terror Under 10 podcast, in which he also performs lead on all featured stories. Webley's work is featured in a number of video games, such as Atrocity from Cold Furnace Studios, Distant Kingdoms from Orthra Studios, and Overload from Revival Productions. He also provides voices for animated projects, as well as narration for a number of educational YouTube channels, including Questen and Electric. You can hear more of Eric Peabody on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, where he holds the second place championship title for 2019's Evil Idol competition. You'll also find more of his work on his website at www.vikingguitar.com. Our second tale of the evening is written by Patrick Narvasa and performed by Eric Peabody, Jesse Cornett, Kyle Stroud, and Justine Anastasia. In it, we will meet a man pressured into listening to a set of audio recordings, and what he hears certainly can't be unheard. Join us as audio takes its most literal form. Now, without further ado, I present to you Funny Recordings. Sometimes the most haunting and the most scarring memories are the ones you just suddenly get from out of nowhere. It's not something that knocks on your door or tells you in advance it's stopping by for a visit. Usually you'd be living in a pretty normal day. When it happens, it just arrives. For me, it was those damn audio files. As I said, it was a pretty normal day. I was doing my homework when my mom knocked on the door and asked me to come eat dinner. I told her that I'd be down in a few minutes before closing all my textbooks and switching off my desk lamp. Before I could leave the room, my phone vibrated on my desk. I looked back around and grabbed it, only to find out it was a text from Jared, my best friend. He told me, in all capital letters, that I should check my email, that it was something important, a matter of life or death. So I turned my computer back on and checked it out. He had sent me six audio files named APD with a bunch of numbers attached to them, which I assumed were the dates. In the body of the email was where he explained that he hacked the attached files from the police department. They were recorded phone calls from an old man and that they were, quote, meme material, unquote. I saw that the files had relatively small sizes, so they were probably short recordings. Oh, what the heck, I could use a few laughs, I told myself. So, I downloaded the six files and listened to them in order. The first one was titled... APD0809.mp3 Ashbury Police Department. Good morning. This is Charles Egret, 24 Baxton, Wallaby Street. Who am I speaking with? This is Officer Paxton. Good morning, Mr. Egret. How may I assist you? Well, it's 2 a.m., and there's a fucking horse in my backyard. Excuse me, sir. There's a damn horse in my backyard, and it's galloping and clacking all around my stone pavement. Hey, man, check this out. I'm sorry, sir. I'd have to... Oh, oh my God. What seems to be the problem, sir? Get shitting. Uh, pardon, sir? The damn horse is shitting on my hydrangeas. Right, sir, we're coming to assist you right away. <sighs> It's all goopy, too. Oh, no. Come quick. I found myself laughing uncontrollably. Maybe it was because I was 18 back then and fart jokes were my weakness. 
I got intrigued because it seemed like the first audio file already contained the main funny element. So, either it was a collection of different phone calls or there was more to the horse story. So, I clicked on the second one right away. The second one was titled APD0810.mp3. Ashbury Police Department. Hello, this is Charles Egret. Good evening, Mr. Egret. How may we assist you? Uh, I just want to thank you for taking care of the damn horse yesterday. No problem, sir. I'm also wondering if you had any cleaning services. I'm sorry, sir. Like to clean diarrhea up off my yard? <sighs> I'm afraid not, sir. We don't do those. We could help you ask some street sweepers, if you like. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Tell them to come by around 9 a.m. tomorrow. Of course, sir. Have a nice evening. I simply gave a slight chuckle. It wasn't as funny as the first one, but I was guessing it would progress into something hilarious. My mother knocked on my door again and angrily asked me to come and eat dinner, so I had to leave the next four until after I was done eating and cleaning the dishes. When I got back to the room, I already felt sleepy, so I went to my windows to close the blinds. Approaching the window, I saw someone walking just outside our backyard fence. I couldn't quite make out who it was, but for some reason I just assumed it was Jared. He does visit our house often, and he'd need to walk from outside our backyard to get to the front door. Jared! Hey, Jared! I shouted from my window. No response. That told me it must have been a mistake. I saw to it that I finished the remaining four audio files so I could laugh about it with Jared before going to sleep. So I played the next two, APD0811.mp3 and APD0812.mp3. Hey, Mary Police Department. Um, hello. Yes, Mr. Egret. I'm just wondering if you've already taken away the horse from last time? Yes, Mr. Egret. The horse is now safely being kept at the Abinelli farm. Right. Well, I I'm sorry to be calling this late. <laughs> what seems to be the matter, sir? Well, I think I'm hearing the horse's clacking footsteps from my backyard again. Can you see where the horse is, sir? No. Th that's, uh, the strange part. I, I can absolutely hear a horse galloping from my backyard. Right. Sir, please stay put and we'll take a look ourselves. That's weird. I told myself and played the next one. Ashbury Police Department. Hi. Yes. It, it's back. Good evening, sir. Duh. Um, hello, young lady. Who's this? This is Officer Herring from the Ashbury Police Department. Who am I speaking with? Charles Egret, 24 Backstreet. Did you hear that? Hear what, sir? The clacking noise. The hoofs. Outside my backyard. There, there's a horse out there. I'm sorry, Mr. Egret. According to a report here, it seems like our men already patrolled that area and found no signs of a horse or any loose animals. Yeah, I, I, uh, I remember. Sorry about that. The last two audio files were very odd. I found it hard to believe that Jared listened to all of these and found them funny. My mouth was half open the whole time I was listening to the recordings, staring at nothing. That's how much the weird recordings got to me. I started the next file, APD0813.mp3. Ashbury Police Department. I'm not kidding this time. There is something walking around in my backyard and... Hello? Sir Egret? It was starting to get to me. 
Every hair on my body stood up and my heart started to race. It was starting to feel like I was listening to something I shouldn't be listening to. I grabbed my phone and texted Jared. Dude, where the hell did you hack these files from? Answer ASAP. I waited for his reply. I tried not to look at my computer and stopped myself from listening to the last file. If it was something that could send me to jail, it would have been best if I were to explain that I didn't finish them. But curiosity is such a bitch. Things like this come into your life for no apparent reason, and most of the time there's nothing you can do to stop it. I played the last file. The title suggests that it was the same date as the previous one. APD 0813-2.mp3 Ashbury Police The clacking noises won't stop! Mr. Egret, what seems to be the problem? Look, I'll let you listen to it. What the... Mr. Egret, are you there? There's someone in my backyard. A person is in your backyard? Yes, he's just standing there. Mr. Egret, I would advise you to please lock your... What's wrong with his face? It's... Uh, uh, what is he looking at? Oh, he's lifting his head. Oh, God, he's looking at me now. Could you describe the man for me? He's he's wearing a brown trench coat and he is bald, but, but there's like some hair, I just think, patches. And uh, he's opening his mouth. Oh, God. Hello? It's him. Mr. Egret, our forces are heading to your house right now and... It's him. He's making that sound. The clacking... It, it's coming from his mouth. Mr. Egret, please calm down and I'll walk you through to make sure you're... He took off his coat. He, he's naked now. He He's so pale. And why are his limbs so long? What the fuck? He's on all fours. What the hell is this crazy guy doing? Hey, get up! Hello? Mr. Egret? He's smiling now. He's running! He's he's heading inside! He's, he's, Mr. Egret, are your front doors locked? Please go make sure. Help! Help! Please! Someone! Hello? Mr. Egret! Help! Please! Someone help! Help! Please! Someone help! Please! Someone! I couldn't say a word. Nothing was going on inside my head except for the old man's screams. That was the most horrifying scream for help I've ever heard. My heart felt like it dropped into my stomach boiling in acid. My chest felt hollow, yet racing. I flinched when my phone vibrated. It was Jared. He was calling me. Even with my palms sweaty and my hands shaking, I was able to swipe to answer his call. Uh, hey. Yo, did you listen to it? <laughs> Jared, where the fuck did you get these? I didn't know you could hack shit, man. What the hell are these? Hey, dude, calm down. What's the matter? I haven't even finished listening to him yet. Don't. What? All right, fine. I didn't really hack it. So you know how my dad's police, right? I borrowed his flash drive and saw these files. They're trying to investigate this case, and there were lots of folders related to it. Just took a listen to one and... Aw, oh, dude, you didn't have to come by. I was confused. His last sentence was completely unrelated. That's when I heard it from his side of the call. From a distance, someone was shouting, Jared! Hey, Jared! 
and then he hung up and never answered again. I hope you enjoyed Funny Recordings, as written by Patrick Narvasa and performed by Eric Peabody, Jesse Cornett, Kyle Stroud, and Justine Anastasia. If you enjoyed Kyle Stroud's performance, you can hear more of him right here on our very own YouTube channel, as well as on his website at kylestroud.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-T-R-O-U-D.com. Justine Anastasia's work is available right here on our official YouTube channel as well. She also has written for the show, as well as being one of the judges for the 2019 Evil Idol voice acting competition. If you enjoyed Mr. Cornette's performance, you can hear more of him on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, as well as on the No Sleep podcast, where you can hear his vocal performances as well as production. Now... Our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012 and consider signing up as a patron at our website chillingtalesfordarknights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad free I'm your host Steve Taylor and it's been a pleasure tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>